I'm going to backtrack a bit before we look at um, advanced imaging or imaging. Um, we have to be confident of our delineation. We have to be confident of the accuracy of the images that we use. Uh, and that's because that's as important as any geometrical accuracy in the radiosurgical process. You can have a very, very accurate treatment device, but if your images aren't accurate, or your delineation isn't accurate, then you're not going to get very good results. So we need a good, wide variety uh, of imaging. So what I want to ask first is, how consistent are we at outlining targets? Another way of looking at that is, do we need to be better? So I'm going to share work uh, with you that was performed by Helena Sandstrom from uh, the Karolinska in Stockholm. So her objective was uh, to look at the multi-observer variability of target delineation for four brain disorders. Uh, that was an anaplastic astrocytoma, which was actually quite an unusual a radiosurgery target, a frontal AVM, a cavernous sinus meningioma, uh, and a post-operative vestibular schwannoma. And these DICOM images were sent to 20 uh, experienced gamma knife perfection users, and they were asked to delineate the, the targets and plan them, and then send them back to her. So let's start with the cavernous sinus meningioma. To me, this looks quite... Uh, clear as to where the lesion is. They were given T1 weighted images with contrast, uh, T2 dedicated coronals, and uh, T2 weighted images. Now, if we look at how uh, the 20 different centers delineated the target, you can see the, uh, the density cloud here, where white shows that all, all, uh, all of the users have delineated that area. You can see that as we go anteriorly, less and less centers have included that within the target volume. Another way of looking at this in 3D is to look at what we call uh, the encompassing volume, which is the volume that any single user, as long as one user contoured that as target, then it gets included in on this red 3D volume. And we also have something called the common outline. And that's the volume that was contoured by every user. Now, if we're consistent, you would expect the purple volume to be the same size and shape as the red volume. But you can see clearly that's not the case. In fact, it's quite astounding. The common volume is just 2.6 cc's but the total volume contoured by one or more user was 13 cc's. I mean, that's a factor of five difference. So clearly something is not right. What about this post-operative vestibular schwannoma? Uh, the T2s aren't that obvious, but um, on the post-contrast here, it looks like there's an intracanalicular component, and then there's a component in the system here. Well, these results were sh truly shocking because it turned out that the common volume between all the different users was just one voxel. Just one tiny voxel was all that could be agreed upon between all of those users. This is absolutely staggering. When you look at the volume again, you can understand maybe some... Uh, I think one user must have just contoured the the component in the system, and another user must have just contoured the component uh, in the IAM. But this is um, incredible. The AVM, we know that there are uh, differences in, in contouring between users uh, in, in AVMs. We know that that's, uh, there's a lot of interpretation that goes on as to what the NIDUS is. But if you can see here, this is a common volume, sorry, this is the common volume and this is the encompassing volume here. A huge difference between the two. So 
um, th there were uh, three lesions, and I think Helena was probably fairly criticised that uh, an anaplastic astrocytoma wasn't a typical radiosurgical target, and the vestibular schwannoma was quite a tricky target. So she actually this, she did perform this for her master's thesis, and then she performed a new study for her PhD thesis, and that involved six different lesions. Again, a cavernous sinus meningioma. To me, that's very, very clear as to where the lesion is. A pituitary adenoma, a vestibular schwannoma, very clear again, and three different metastases. So uh, the centers returned the, the volumes, and you, here you can see the volumes superimposed on one another. Quite a variation with the meningioma, maybe not so much with the pituitary tumor, the vestibular schwannoma is not too bad. Um, and then there's quite a difference here in the metastases. Uh, some people seem to have uh, added a margin, some people haven't. And I guess adding a margin is um, a, a rational thing maybe to do. So here you can see the, the, uh, the cloud showing the, the amount of uh, agreement between the different users. So if we just go through the cavernous sinus meningioma, uh, you can see the encompassing volume here and the common volume, sorry, common volume and the encompassing volume. Um, it's a factor of four, just over four there. So not that much better than before. Um, she looked to see whether uh, experience versus volume made a difference. So this is the experience in years um, of the various uh, users that delineated the target and uh, maybe there was some trend there. I'm not too sure if that was statistically significant or not. Uh, pituitary adenoma, again, uh, common volume and encompassing volume, uh, less than a factor of three there in terms of the differences. Vestibular schwannoma, um, sorry, I can't see the, the, but much, much better agreement than there was with the previous uh, lesion. And you can see with each of these experience versus volume, it seems like more experienced users seem to draw a smaller volume. And then here's one of the metastases, uh, pretty good agreement between the two. Uh, less with this one here and, and less with this one here. So I think the conclusion from this, for any of you who uh, previous to this talk thought, well, we're we're doing okay. We don't need to change the way that we image or, or target our, our lesions. Um, hopefully I've convinced you now that we need to do better. So we need to be able to, to delineate our targets. We need to be able to see our targets clearly. And there are different, uh, different imaging techniques where you can see your tumor or you cannot see your tumor but all of them add some value to the treatment planning process. So here are T2s. But if we have all three together, we start to see the true picture. We can see uh, the tumor here. We can see the organs at risk, the cochlea, uh, the cranial nerves. Uh, CT certainly gives us some confidence as to um, uh, some maybe additional positional accuracy as to where the the lesion is, and then here we've, we've done some fancy fusion uh, techniques so that we can see here, for instance, the bone, um, but we can see the enhancement of the MRT1 image uh, in the IAM. So our main two methods of imaging are CT and, and MRI, and, and CT is high resolution. It's also high signal to noise. But what it lacks is, is it has a very low contrast to noise in soft tissue. While MRI is medium to high resolution, but a low signal to noise, um, but a high contrast to noise when it comes to normal tissue. Uh, Stephen Holmes is a, a well-known uh, neuroradiologist that works with the Gamma Knife in, in Honolulu, Hawaii. And I'm quoting him here, for every type of pathology, there's an MR sequence that will completely miss it. And we know that MR sequences are a compromise between contrast to noise, 
Um, the more contrast and noise we have, the better clarity we have of our target. Uh, resolution, uh, the higher the resolution of our images, the less we get the partial volume effect creeping in. But all of this is related to scan time. And that's one of the fights that we have. Uh, as radio surgeons, we want to get the best quality images. We know that the quality of the images will affect our targeting and could potentially affect uh, the treatment that we give the patient for the rest of their lives. And yet the MR uh, technicians or the MR staff, all they want to do is get a patient in and get them out of the MRI scanner as quickly as possible. And there are times when you can compromise significantly on MRI uh, because all you need is a diagnosis. But we want more than a diagnosis. We want to do more than just see the target. We need to be able to very accurately trace the 3D volume of the target. So we have considerations in imaging. We have the accuracy of the scan sequence, and then the clarity of the margins of the lesion, and then clarity of critical structures. And ideally, we need to maximize all of those as much as possible. I've worked with uh, around 60 uh, radio surgery centers, uh, helping them to get the most out of their MR scanners. And these are the, the T1 sequences that I would normally recommend uh, to those centers. So uh, you can see Philip, Siemens, and GE. Uh, we use different, uh, well, the manufacturers call them different names. Um, but they're all 3D gradient echoes. And a 3D gradient echo uh, with a 10-minute scan time can normally get you very thin cuts uh, through the entire head. So we, we go for either a 1 or 1.5 millimeter scan thickness, around 100 plus slices. Uh, we go for a field of view of 210 millimeters. And typically, we get a 256 matrix from that. And then in addition to that, we like to have T2-weighted uh, images, particularly for all uh, benign and functional targets. And these are the T2 sequences that we use. So uh, for Philips, it's a T2 uh, turbo spin echo. For Siemens, it's a, a, a CIS, but also they do a very good turbo spin echo. And then for the GE, it's a 3D FRFSE. Um, we get less slices, but for the T2 weighted images, we just want slices through the lesion itself. We don't need any more than that. So we're quite happy to compromise on the number of slices, uh, but have a much higher resolution. So typically, these tend to be a 512 matrix image sequence. I've yet to find uh, a really good 512 image sequence for GE. I find that the images from a GE scanner are, are typically more noisy than they are from uh, a Philips uh, and a Siemens unit. So uh, a 448 metric matrix is about the maximum that I've managed to uh, achieve with that. So these are uh, Philips images now, and you can see a very nice 3D uh, image sequence here of the, the, the trigeminal nerve. You can see uh, vessels around the nerve. I think that's uh, the sort of image that you would like to have uh, for treatment planning. Um, this is uh, a, a GE FRFSE, and you can see very nicely uh, the nerve there and the branches of the nerve in Methcal's cave. For Siemens users, this is the CIS, which is, is good for visualizing the, the cranial nerves in the system. But what you're really seeing is sort of like the shadows of the nerves. You get very, very little uh, image signal from the neural tissue itself. And so sometimes a turbo spin echo is required, like this one here. And also, you get a much better um, Gray white matter differentiation um, if, if you do a turbo spin echo. Um, here's an example of uh, T2 weighted images um, used to show up the optic apparatus here. Shows up very clearly on the T2s, but not on the T1s. So if there's anyone in the room that's performing radio surgery on benign targets and doesn't use T2 weighted images, I would strongly recommend that you do. Uh, a paracellar mass here, you know, on, on T1s, it's very difficult to know what to outline because you've got a lot of 
enhancing structures. On the T2, you can see beautifully all of these uh, additional vessels on the edge. This is not the sort of case that you would normally choose for a radiosurgical target. This patient had been operated on and a very experienced surgeon had been um, uh, fought back with uh, copious amounts of bleeding, so we decided to perform radiosurgery. We actually removed these vessels from the target volume and that created quite a nice buffer between the edge of the target and the brain stem. For vestibular schwannoma, um, T1 is fine, but T2 will give you your additional organs at risk. Um, and here we can see very nicely uh, the cranial nerves coming off the tumour. It is surprising still how many uh, centres I visit that just uh, perform T1 weighted images, and that's it. And they're often very, very short, so you know, sometimes they say, oh, but the, the scanning staff, they'll only give us five minutes scanning time. So we just do a T1 and that's it. Uh, cystic tumours, uh, if you just use T1s, there's a very good chance that you'll miss some of the, the lesion. Uh, but with T2s, the cysts show up very nicely, um, uh, hyper-intense as opposed to the CSF, and, and you can uh, more accurately delineate your target. For AVMs, uh, the, these high-resolution uh, T2 weighted images are extremely useful for uh, visualizing the target, and they can also differentiate between uh, uh, ischemic tissue, which sometimes enhances on the T1 with contrast images. Here's an example of um, a lesion that was contoured by a neuroradiologist just using T1 weighted images. And you might look at that lesion and say, well, that, that's a reasonable contour. But when we did additional T2 weighted images, uh, you can see what, what I've called the true outline of the target here. And you can see how much smaller it was than the original estimation on the T1. And because the optic nerve was actually very, very close to the anterior edge of this tumour, it meant that we were able to bring dose uh, off the optic apparatus and uh, increase the prescription dose to the lesion. Coronal views can be very useful, but if you have isotropic voxels, um, you can then you can reformat in coronal and sagittal planes uh, very easily. But these are dedicated T2 weighted images showing very nicely a pituitary adenoma just here. Craniopharyngiomas, uh, they're rare targets, but uh, here very, very difficult to work out where it is, but on the T2, very, very clear indeed. So hopefully I've convinced those, uh, if there is anyone in the room that didn't believe in T2-weighted images, that they have excellent tissue discrimination. They can help reduce your target volume, uh, but it's important to have high-resolution T2-weighted images. And those are simply to complement the T1 gradient echo sequences. What else can we use? Well, maybe a bit of PET. Uh, it's not MRI, but I think it can be useful, particularly in the uh, differentiation between uh, recurrent tumour and radionecrosis. So this is a, an interesting case I'd like to share with you. This is a patient uh, with uh, breast metastases that had already received two sessions of radiosurgery. And you can see this huge mass uh, in the cerebellum up against the brainstem here. Um, the patient wanted further treatment, and we performed a, an FDG PET, and we got this sort of activity here just on the left side of the patient, but interestingly not on the right. And in fact, what that al allowed us to do was we could then actually see that there was a significant difference in the signal on the MRI uh, between this part of the lesion on the the patient's right and that on the left, which was more PET active. And if we look at that, uh, this is the treatment plan that we actually gave. And if we look at that in 3D, you can see here the significant volume that we were able to avoid um, by ignoring that 
uh, that area that wasn't metabolically uh, active on the FDG PET. And obviously that was quite a brave decision to make to only treat part of the lesion that was enhancing. Um, we felt a bit anxious about it, but then we also felt that the, the total volume was so large that it would have been David, dangerous to offer radio surgery. Um, but you can see here on the six-month follow-up how uh, th this, these are the follow-up scans here. You can see that not only the, the lesion that we treated has melted away, but also um, that area that we presumed was, was radionecrosis. So uh, the patient actually benefited quite a lot from this treatment. So I'm going to show some um, images now from... Uh, this is a, a slide from uh, Stephen Holmes's talk um, where we're asking uh, the differentiation of active tumour versus radionecrosis. This is really important. This is one of the critical um, decision-making processes that you have when you retreat a patient. You know, if, if, the, if the patient's got an active recurrent tumour, it needs to be treated. If they got radionecrosis, treatment's only going to make the patient worse. So what do you do? It's really important that we're able to differentiate between the two. And there are actually four different uh, MR sequences that we can use. One is called the T1, T2 mismatch. And for those of you that aren't familiar with that, if you look at the enhancing mass on a T1 weighted image sequence, and contour that, and then project that onto a T2-weighted image. If there's a match, the edge of the, the, the legion matches um, on the T2, then the chances are it's active tumour. And if there is a mismatch, then the chances are it's radionecrosis. And that has a sensitivity of 83% specificity of 91%. There's MR perfusion. Again, that's got a fairly good sensitivity and specificity. Um, and then there's uh, arterial spin labelling. You can look at blood flow. And that's been described as being highly accurate. And then there's MR spectroscopy, which was described as being high diagnostic accuracy. So, as Stephen said, these all work 70 to 83% of the time, but doesn't it make sense to understand them and combine them? And surely we can, uh, we, if we combine these together, we're going to get uh, a much better uh, estimation of, of where, whether we do have uh, tumor progression or radionecrosis. Of course, there have been no studies to look at that, to combine all four of these, but it would be very interesting uh, to see that. Here's another example. This is a, a, a patient treated for all of these metastases. Um, but first of all, there was a, um, the, the patient received a, an MR image, and they just you, you, uh, received um, gadolinium contrast injection using a contrast agent known as Dotarem, which uh, is used widely in the National Health Service in the UK. Um, I, I compare it to saline or distilled water. It, it uh, has very, very little T1 real activity. Uh, compared with uh, Multihance or, or Gadavist, that has a much, much stronger T1 real activity. And it's amazing how many more lesions you can pick up with these, um, the, these contrast agents than you can with uh, standard Dotarem. And this shows an example of that because the patient, when they were originally imaged with Dotarem, uh, just these coloured lesions were shown up. Uh, these blue lesions didn't appear. And then the following week, we, we did a, a triple-dose gadolinium study. Now, I know a lot of centres that go for double-dose. A triple-dose is quite brave, but it's something that we've been doing at the Cromwell Hospital in London for uh, over 15 years, and, and we really... Uh, value that. And there's a very good paper by Patrick Hansons um, that talks about the implications of detecting those additional 
uh, brain micrometastases using high-resolution MRI. So in terms of metastasis treatment, um, I, I've described actually the, the metastasis treatment as a historical perspective. Um, it might be that 20 years ago, uh, when I started performing radiosurgery, uh, most of the imaging was CT imaging. Maybe we only saw 50% of the metastases in the patient. And so when we treated the, the, the patient, uh, three months later, new metastases would appear. They were there at the original treatment, it's just that they weren't large enough to be shown. And so I, I remember getting a lot of criticism from uh, clinical oncologists that said, well, look, if you've got five metastases in this patient, you're going to have five more at the next follow-up. So there's no point in treating the patient. And we now know that that's not true with better imaging. Maybe 10 years ago, we had uh, poorer MR imaging. Maybe we had an 80% hit rate. Um, for gamma knife users, we had either the Model B or the Model 4C, which was a, quite an inefficient treatment. So it was very difficult to justify the additional treatment time that it took to treat patients with these multiple lesions. Nowadays, we've got higher resolution, higher contrast imaging. Maybe we've got a 95% hit rate. Um, and it's not that difficult to treat patients with multiple uh, lesions, depending on your, uh, your, the technology that you're using. And maybe in the future we'll have higher resolution, maybe we'll have better contrast agents, and we'll get closer to a 100% hit rate, uh, and then maybe we won't be criticised anymore um, that radiosurgery only treats the lesions that you can see, uh, but whole, tra whole brain radiotherapy treats the lesions that you can't see. What other MR techniques can we use? Uh, I, I'm working with uh, a, a neurosurgeon uh, called Alvaro Villabona, who's doing a PhD thesis at the moment, um, asking, can we uh, use angiography, um, MR angiography, and use that as a non-invasive technique as opposed to conventional uh, DSA? And there are techniques uh, such as arterial spin labeling uh, that show a lot of promise. Arterial spin labelling, it, it's a perfusion technique and it ex exploits the ability of MRI to magnetically label uh, arterial blood below the imaging slab. So arterial blood is, is labelled magnetically uh, before it flows in, into the brain. And this is, uh, these are some images um, from what he's actually achieved, and I think they're quite impressive. So what we're, what we're seeing here are uh, images of the nidus uh, with a temporal resolution of just 200 milliseconds. So uh, using this technique, we're able to uh, acquire images five times a second with MRI. And I think that's, that's quite impressive. These then get um, converted into a, a, a MIP, what's called a MIP. So they, they look very, very similar to conventional angio images. And at the moment, we're just trying to see what sort of difference we get in the defined nidus, depending on which technique that we use. There's also um, contrast-enhanced MRA. Um, and this using the keyhole method where you just sample 20% uh, of case space means that you can again get very, very fast images. And you can see that they're fairly comparable to what you would get with angiography. So this is another slide from uh, Stephen Holmes uh, showing what imaging he routinely performs for uh, both gamma knife radio surgery of patients with metastases, but also for follow-up as well. So he encourages uh, users to standardize pro protocols in terms of slice thickness. Um, you've got gradient echo versus spin echo, I would say gradient echo is the best there. Um, try and use the same dose and type of contrast. It's important if, you, if you're following a patient up, you want to use the same sort of imaging sequence that you used 
uh, for your radio surgery planning because then you can compare like with like and I would uh, strongly recommend if it's possible to do volumetric follow-up so that means contouring the lesions um, on your follow-up scans if that's if that's possible uh, he prefers 3T over 1.5T um, you do get increased signal to noise and that might allow you to achieve higher resolution um, there are some issues with 3T scanners in that you can get greater geometrical distortion. So there are pros and cons with using that technique. And then he uses uh, six anatomical sequences, so diffusion-weighted imaging, T1, T2, uh, then post-contrast flare, um, T1 in two planes with multiplanar reformations. He uses a double dose of GAD, and he uses three functional MR sequences. So arterial spin labelling, um, MR perfusion, and uh, spectroscopy. So that's a lot of imaging. What about perfusion MRI? Well, perfusion-weighted imaging is, is a term used to donate a variety of MRI techniques, um, but these techniques are able to give insights into the perfusion of tissues by blood. And there are three techniques in wide use to derive uh, these perfusion values. So you've got uh, something called dynamic susceptibility contrast perfusion, dynamic contrast enhanced perfusion, and then arterial spin labeling. And here's an example. Um, again, it's a slide from Stephen Holmes uh, showing uh, what looks like a vestibular schwannoma, but um, when, when the patient was referred for radio surgery, there was a question mark over whether it was a meningioma. Um, but he, he's shown here that uh, fMRI has, has allowed confirmation that it is an acoustic. Um, it's fairly round, which suggests it's an acoustic. In terms of internal blood, uh, it's fairly low, so that suggests it's an acoustic. Um, the uh, MR spectroscopy also points to being an acoustic and blood flow here is relatively low, suggesting it's an acoustic. So acoustics tend to have a relatively low uh, cerebral blood flow, uh, a, a relatively low um, a blood volume, while meningiomas like this one here uh, tend to be relatively high, uh, which you can see here. So here's an interesting example he, he showed where you've got uh, an 82-year-old patient uh, with two CP angle masses uh, on the left and on the right, uh, both enhanced significantly. Um, but can you use MRI to differentiate whether they're both acoustics, both the meningiomas, or one's an acoustic and one's a meningioma? So looking at this here, uh, we can see the, the lesion on the right it has a low blood flow and low blood volume, so it's most likely an acoustic, uh, while on the right we've got uh, high blood flow, uh, high blood volume, and that would suggest that it's a meningioma on the left. And that allowed the, uh, the planning team to be able to set uh, appropriate doses, deliver appropriate doses to the tumour, so the meningioma would have received a higher dose than the vestibular schwannoma. Can we improve visualisation of organs at risk? Well, as I've already mentioned, I think the T2 weighted imaging sequences are, are mandatory for most uh, intracranial organs at risk. But can we also use uh, diffusion MR tractography and traditionally, that's thought to be very difficult. It's what other centres do. It's not what we necessarily do. Um, it's also thought to be incompatible with the stereotactic frame, which is another reason why maybe um, centres, some Linux centres and Gamini centres would not, would not use that. But we routinely perform this image sequence um, at BART's with the stereotactic frame in place and with a Philips 1.5T scanner. So what is uh, diffusion tensor MRI? Just for those of you that are 
know that it, it represents having very, very pretty pictures. Um, so DTI is an MRI technique that uses anisotropic diffusion to estimate uh, axons and the directions of axons um, in the brain. And fiber tractography, it's a 3D reconstruction technique to access neural tracts using data collected by DTI, that's diffusion tensor imaging. And within cerebral white matter, water molecules tend to diffuse more freely along the direction of the axons than they do across them. And it's that directional dependence uh, which is termed anisotropy. So here's an example of uh, a patient uh, that we imaged. So we would perform a, a T1 weighted image sequence for this patient. Uh, it's a metastasis, so we probably would go for a flare, but we probably wouldn't use a conventional uh, T2 weighted image sequence. And then uh, we decided to perform uh, tractography on this. And we can see here just a, a little bit of this, this is the lesion here. We can see some um, displacement and compression of the corticospinal tract in this case. Uh, here's another example of uh, an AVM. And here we've managed to seg segment um, the corticospinal tract uh, and show displacement there, at least see where, where it is. Um, here's an example of uh, a patient on the day of treatment for 27 metastases. And uh, at the 10-month follow-up, this just shows um, that the tracts are still intact despite the, the treatment for 27 uh, separate brain mets. Um, certainly, in terms of uh, DTI, the patient looks in good condition. Uh, Moji Hodai from, uh, from uh, Princess Margaret Hospital in uh, Toronto has done some work on tractography in relation to uh, trigeminal neuralgia. And um, one of the things suggested from her work is that the, the, the return of um, um, uh, fractional anisotropy to baseline may correlate with pain recurrence. Um, and this is work in progress. So how do we uh, how do we create these uh, these DTI images? Um, this is the method that that we use. It takes, I think, about half an hour to perform. Um, it's published in in JNS here, um, but we use a, a Stealth Viz workstation, which I think is free software. So I don't think it's even got a cost uh, associated with it. You obviously need to have the DTI package on your, your MRI scanner, but once you've got that, then um, uh, creating these images and exporting them into uh, Gamma Plan is possible. You don't see the tracks on your treatment planning system, but what you're able to do is segment the tracks and export that as a volume to your treatment planning system. So you see the, the volume of the, the overall volume of the tracks. Just coming back to a few tips and tricks, just for practical um, dose planning purposes. One of the things that I see, one of the f potential faults I see at a lot of different centers that I visit is uh, something as simple as windowing. It's incredible how much uh, information you can lose from an image just by having inappropriate windowing. And I'm, I'm surprised sometimes when uh, the the uh, clinicians that do the contouring really don't understand about windowing. They don't know what they're doing. They just click here, click there, and they get an image that they think is, is reasonable. Um, and maybe here's an example. So you can see we've got a T1-weighted image, a T2, and a, a CT. And what I've done here is just done a, a snapshot of the screen um, this is after a, a, a clinician has contoured the target. Um, the the T2-weighted image here, actually, I think is, is pretty perfectly um, contoured. We can see the cochlea. We can see 
uh, cranial nerve here, we can see the tumour. But you can see that the T1-weighted image, this is a very small tumour, T1-weighted images, the voxels tend to be about one cubic millimetre in volume. So you get, um, you get a partial volume effect that takes place. And that partial volume effect is increased as you narrow your window and you get saturation uh, inside your target. So you can see that the target here is just, it's just all white. You can't see any structure within the target. And as a result, what happens is the, the voxels on the edge of the target also, instead of appearing sort of a grey colour, they'll start to appear white as well, hyper-intense or equal intensity. And so the temptation is to contour the target larger than you would do if you had a wider window. And you can see that because this contour that's now projected on the T2, you can see how it's quite generous. On the CT, it looks incredibly generous. It looks like uh, you're uh, contouring here uh, soft tissue, but also a significant amount of bone. But that's because this CT window image is also incorrectly windowed and is saturated. So the bone is looking much larger than it is in reality. So let's go ahead and re-window the T1 and the CT so that we don't have any of this saturation. And you can see now we have, I'm still looking at the same outline that we had before, but that outline is starting to look a little bit more generous, particularly along that anterior edge, which is probably where the, the facial nerve is lying. Um, and you can see now the CT looks very, very different. There's a much better agreement there. But again, uh, on the T1, the T2, and the CT, it suggests that maybe uh, the target has been delineated a little bit too generously on the anterior edge. So that's something that you get for nothing. It doesn't cost any more scanning time. It's just a case of correctly windowing your images. And it turned out that if we recontoured this using these images, we actually reduced the target by 18% in this case. So this is something worth bearing in mind. If you have very narrow windowing, you'll get an exacerbation of the, the partial volume effect your targets will be larger, your treatment will be larger, you'll be irradiating more normal tissue. So uh, to summarise that, I said saturated T1 with contrast images overestimates volume. For um, Philips and Siemens scanners, um, you need to make the minimum uh, window value zero, and that will help um, reduce the amount of uh, saturation that you have. Uh, for GE, it's this magic number, 32768. And then you adjust your max value to try and show some internal structure within the tumour, and that will ensure that you don't have saturation and you minimise your partial volume effect. What other things can we do? Well, we can look at phased array uh, versus birdcage single coils. So, a phased array coil, like this one here, has up to 64 elements. The advantage of these coils, compared with the, the old-style, much larger single-element coils, is that you get increased uh, signal-to-noise ratio, but you also get reduced scanning time because it allows you to perform some parallel imaging. The problem is that if you have a stereotactic frame, they tend to just fit in single-element coils. And I think for some uh, indications, there is a justification for using uh, these 64-element coils and then co-registering your MRI, your non-stereotactic MRI, uh, to stereotactic CTs. How do we get... Uh, everybody wants to have 3T scanners, but actually 3T scanners have a significant amount of distortion what can we do to try and get better images if we've just got a 1.5T scanner? Well, as I've already mentioned, we can use high relaxivity contrast agents, uh, multi -hance. I don't know if that's available now within the EU. I know it was banned a little while ago. So we are using Gadavist now, which uh, we find extremely uh, useful. 
If you're imaging for uh, metastases, particularly smaller metastases, consider delaying scanning after the contrast injection. And if you make a 20-minute delay, you often get increased uptake uh, and an increased conspicuity of, of smaller lesions. You can always optimize scanning protocols a little bit better, and I'd recommend that you try and get a little bit more MR scanning time um, than you're currently getting if you're not happy with your imaging. You can use phased array head coils and then co-register. And if you do have a stereotactic frame, if the patient's being held in the scanner with a stereotactic frame, do remember uh, acquisition times of up to 15 minutes are possible because the patient is not going to move. And so you won't get any um, uh, motion artifact that, that's typical with a 15-minute scan time. So to summarize, uh, I've said, g given the variation that we saw in target delineation, the first few slides of this talk, uh, multiple image studies uh, can be used to increase confidence and the consistency of target volume. And T1, T2, arterial spin labeling, perfusion, diffusion, tractography, as well as PET and CT and angio can help to achieve this. And image quality is critical. Uh, Inadequate contrast to noise can render micrometastases undetected and untreated, leading to what some people would describe as treatment failure. Thank you very much for your attention.